All right, good morning and welcome. This morning's session is exploring the advantage of a collaborative full-scale exercise engagement. I'm Mike Waters, the Deputy Director of the Division of Preparedness Response at NRC. This panel will discuss the upcoming Cobalt Magnet 25 exercise, which will launch in just about a year from now. CM25 is a large-scale nuclear emergency exercise in the great state of Michigan, close to the Canadian border. This exercise will be led by DOE NNSA with the participation from a wide range of federal, state, local, and international response organizations. The scale of CM25 is very complex and quite ambitious, which the panel here will explain today. So why is this important? We all know that the risk of an accident is very low and nuclear power is indeed safe. Indeed safe. And we know that emergency preparedness is a key component of the safety framework that we all share. And all emergency management organizations know that good collaboration, communication, and practice beforehand will substantially improve an act, our response if an actual event were to happen. So this expert panel representing DOE, NRC, EPA, Michigan, and Canada will discuss their programs, the roles they will play, and um, provide perspectives of upcoming exercise followed by a Q&A session. For those here in the room, please make sure to scan the um, QR code if it's up on the screen. Um, you'll see a, a tab to ask questions. For those joined virtually, um, welcome as well. There should be a tab to the right of your screen where you'll find Q&A well, Q box as well. Your questions will be added to the queue and we'll get through as many questions as possible following the presentations. With that, let's jump right in. And introduced first, we have Dr. Wendy Renault representing the Department of Energy. She is leading the planning of the cobalt magnet exercise for DOE. Wendy is the founder and president of Radiation Emergency Services, which specializes in training solutions using science-based simulation software for radiation disaster preparedness. Wendy has supported NNSA programs since 2010 and was also heavily involved in the creation of many of the Fermac radiological data products that were used to support decision making by federal, by federal agencies and the government of Japan. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm waiting for the first slide to pop up. It appears we might have a technical glitch. <laughs> well, I can just go ahead and start talking if you want me to wait. Can you tell me? Okay. Well, in the interest of time while they're working it out, I, I pretty much know what I have on the slide, so it'll pop up in a moment. But uh, the first slide that you'll see whenever they resolve it is uh, just really talking about a, a, big, a bit of the background of Department of Energy and a whole host of emergency response uh, functions that our teams support from the left of boom, uh, you know, prevention of nuclear disasters to the right side, which is the part that I've spent my career uh, working within. Um, from there, we have the consequence management response team and home team, which are um, some of the teams I myself served on before moving over to planning on these teams. So those are those first boots on the ground that get to these exercises or real world events. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a second and see how we're doing on the slides. Okay, we'll just keep going. I can get them on my phone. Uh, so. The next slide really is starting to talk about, I believe, the background of what it is that FERMAC um, is. Oh, there we go. All right, so if we can go first slide, like second slide. Sorry, everyone. We'll get there. All right, so this is the one that I just spoke to. So really just a, a little bit more depth on that. So public health and safety, um, countering weapons of mass destruction, and then also forensic. So this whole host of, of capabilities that you see in front of you. So since I've already pretty much briefed that, uh, we'll go to the next one. Um, so here is to talk about the Federal Radiological Monitoring and Assessment Center, or FERMAC, in the mission space. So Department of Energy responders are the ones that make up the first team that is you know, in charge of kind of managing the FERMAC. And so the job of that team is really to provide technical expertise, um, health physics, uh, 
people to go out and do field monitoring. We have aerial monitoring teams, uh, environmental sampling, and technical assistance to do data visualization. So really all of that folds together to provide a really good common operating picture of what's happening with the radiological disaster to inform really the decision makers to make the best, most informed decisions possible. Next slide, please. So what is that made up of? And so this is what I started to talk to without the slide up. But so the home team is a scalable support. It is remote and across the country, centered in Nevada, which is actually where I'm from. But a lot of scientists from around the country dial in. It gets you atmospheric modeling. It gets you uh, people to start answering questions, making data products, reports, things of that nature. So in the beginning of the Fukushima response, I actually was on the home team that very first night as the rest of our responding team, or CMRT, um, was deploying to Fukushima. And so we were immediately getting data in Japan, uh, linked up with the embassy and making products. So it's a really valuable tool if you're not familiar with it. Um, the response team that goes out, it's full field support, 50 to 100 people, uh, additional technical resources and leadership. Um, and then the advanced command is six to seven people that make up really the management of the FERMAC or our consequence management response team that's deploying to integrate into the response and find out what the needs are at the local level. Next slide, please. So a little bit about why you're on here and learning about Cobalt Magnet. Uh, the exercise started, and we've been exercising for many years before my career even started, but it wasn't as formal in terms of this DOE-led exercise. So the first time we really had that, it was a partnership in 2015 in South Carolina. Uh, and so that was a power plant exercise called Southern Exposure. And you see a, a picture of the room where they had, this is before drones were a big thing, so they had a drone fly over us and make us all look like we were working. So we weren't allowed to look up, by the way. Um, back then, that was pretty novel. <laughs> Anyway, so that was a power plant exercise, but it was a graded exercise. And if you're familiar, which I'm sure everyone in this room is somewhat familiar with graded exercises, uh, there's a little bit of a, a problem there in the sense of people really being afraid to fail, uh, failed to test things. And so it really, we didn't get what we needed out of it from our, our end within the Department of Energy Responders. Uh, so then we, in 2016, went to Minnesota, and that was again a power plant exercise. That one was centered around three weeks in, and so there was a lot more sampling happening. Um, Minnesota actually did it really well. They were excited about the exercise, and they uh, really leveraged the assets and the resources and capabilities that came in and planning, which is, I think, something a lot of us are going to talk about is the value of the collaborations and relationships and planning. So we also worked on the transition of DOE leading the FERMAC to EPA leading the FERMAC in that exercise. Um, CM22, which is when it finally had a name, we started thinking to ourselves, well, no one really knows what all these individual named exercises are, and since this is the DOE-led exercise, we should probably have a consistent naming convention. So that's the first one that actually was called Cobalt Magnet. Um, so that was an RDD scenario that was in Texas, uh, and we were going to do search transition to uh, the response piece, and it got scaled back a bit to where the search was really only more of a day. Uh, originally, we were going to have a, bit, uh, a much more significant um, search piece. Um, so that was, I'm sorry, 22, and I, uh, sorry, that was, yes. And I'm skipping Florida. Um, anyway, I'm going to move on for time. All right, so next is uh, CM25. So this is a really exciting exercise. We've grown uh, our team quite large. Uh, so we have about 300 planners on the team now, and it will be in March 20, uh, for, excuse me, 14th to 21st of 25. Uh, the first day of that exercise is gonna give us a lot of opportunity to do a lot of those remote things that we, we are working on within the home team and deploying. And then EPA actually is going to have a workshop that will be now down to one day in 25 um, May. And then again, we all know it's a power plant release centered around Fermi 2 nuclear power plant in Michigan. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to read all the objectives to you, but I will kind of talk to them. So these objectives were made up from all of the planning team members over a year ago submitting what they were interested in, in addition to what the Department of Energy leadership was interested in, folding them together to make up our overarching objectives. You'll see that they represent incident management, they represent um, public messaging, they represent the technical and scientific capabilities that are needed to be done well. Uh, and so in all of that in harmony is, is these, uh, 
big level objectives that make up what we're trying to do for this exercise. Next slide, please. So there's some really exciting things that are very, uh, I'm excited uh, for, very unique for CM25. Um, the first of which is that, again, as I was mentioning a moment ago, FEMA isn't evaluating this exercise. So we can actually test failures. We can really look and see where things break so we can get better, which is the whole point of exercising. Uh, it also will be an exercise where we're playing plume phase. Uh, if you're familiar with the way that the rep exercises go, uh, there's a nice clean break between when we have plume phase, if you will, and when we're doing and focusing on ingestion. Whereas this case, our players are deploying in plume phase. And so uh, I'm being very, very hard on the team in terms of not sharing logistics details or wind direction or anything of that nature so that our players can make decisions in real time. We're actually going through the efforts of securing multiple locations in some cases where deploying teams can choose. So they can really actually think and learn what they don't often get to learn and we haven't done that since really Fukushima. Uh, so you'll see that's the team there getting on the plane uh, from Nellis Air Force Base when we deployed to Fukushima. It's a big deal to me uh, in my own heart because when our team was deploying and I was on the home team, I was the scientist that they were calling saying, hey, do we have any data on what's happening in Japan? And it took a while to get that data because our team was going and not knowing, you know, where they were landing, where they were sleeping, where they were working. So having to think those thoughts for an exercise is going to be something I think very valuable uh, to, to everybody. Uh, the other pieces is that we're actually investing heavily in lab samples. There's going to be spiked samples that will be similar to the simulated release conditions. What's really great is we're going to be sending uh, samples to multiple labs around uh, Michigan, uh, Department of Energy labs around the country, um, our Canadian partners, as well as some in Indiana. And then they're going to be able to look at those samples after the exercise to help inform some of the data products for the recovery workshop. That's really unique because often these exercises get cut short and the labs really don't get to walk through that process of do these samples answer the questions to a fidelity with which I need to make decisions related to agriculture and, and other topics that are of interest in the recovery phase. Um, and we also are playing heavily on simulated media. So that will also be great because we also experience issues with uh, problems with our players not really feeling the depth and the importance of what they're doing and sometimes they get into exercise mode. Um, so having a robust simulated media means that we will be able to really engage our players to the most extensive level possible. And we're also going to be doing some joint missions with our Canadian partners on the aerial piece. So our Department of Energy uh, plane and helicopters, as well as the Canadian ones, are interested in flying at least over some strip of uh, the same land or water to calibrate together, which is a unique uh, opportunity for us all. And so that's all I really had to kind of lay the foundation for the rest of us. Uh, so I will turn it on over to the next slide and the next speaker. Great, Woody. Thanks for the overview. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jeff Grant from NRC. For the past 16 years, Jeff has served as a team leader for the NRC Incident Response Training, Exercise, and Qualification Program. He's responsible for the oversight of the agency's incident response programs and helps ensure that our emergency response staff are equipped with the necessary knowledge and tools to perform their emergency response roles. He's also the person who helps prepare our chair and commissioners for their incident response leadership roles as well. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a few upfront notes. Uh, Wendy stole most of my thunder, some of those key talking points uh, about the value of an exercise like this, where you can bring all of the collaborative pieces together to exercise uh, over one period of time, over an extended period of time, uh, on a more realistic time scale, is really the value and um, what I was trying to bring to bear to, to talk about both how the, this will benefit the NRC uh, in the lead up and planning, uh, and then the execution and then the lessons learned that will follow. So uh, you'll hear a lot of the same points being echoed, uh, but I'll try to focus my attention more uh, specifically on the NRC and the value that it's gonna hold for us. Next slide. So first, you know, I felt it important to talk a little bit about what the NRC does and what our focus is uh, during an event. Uh, and much of that revolves around our oversight of the operator, the licensee's uh, emergency, uh, what it is that they're doing to confront the event and stabilize it, uh, as well as 
um, the actions that they're taking, uh, if it's if it's worsening in nature, you know, what are they doing and what, what priorities do they have uh, on site and how are they following their procedures? That's a major focus from a technical standpoint as we're sort of trying to uh, better understand the event and sort of track along with the event from the licensee's perspective. And then once it starts to sort of veer in a worsening direction, there could be a possible uh, consequence to the off-site community. Uh, we are doing a lot of assessment and prognosis to be able to independently uh, understand the event and make sure that the licensee uh, or operator uh, is bringing to bear everything that they can uh, to protect the health and safety of the public off-site uh, and then get in front of you know anything that might be uh, leaning in the direction of some type of off-site consequence. Uh, so we do a lot of, we focus a lot of our attention on being able to do that assessment and prognosis independently and then sort of marry that together with uh, what is actually happening, what the licensee is telling us uh, to make sure all of those coincide and everything that's happening is in the best interest of public health and safety. Uh, so that's something that we often practice during our uh, normal cadre of exercises. What we don't have an opportunity to really fully practice on a, a larger scale is some of the coordination activities and harmonization of uh, communicating and coordinating response activities with federal, state, international, uh, territorial, local uh, response partners because the type of exercise that we normally participate in is somewhat limited in nature uh, and participated primarily by the NRC, uh, the operator, as well as uh, some component of the state uh, based on uh, certain objectives and what they're trying to uh, uh, meet for their um, inspection. Um, it kind of gives us a limited groundwork to, to be able to better understand uh, when all these assets are brought to bear, uh, how will that impact you know, our agency? Uh, so I think that that's one of the true values of an exercise on this scale with all the uh, key participants uh, playing uh, that will allow us both in the lead up planning piece and then the, the exercise itself to be able to better understand what those impacts are, uh, where our respective lanes are, uh, being able to ensure that you know all our principals understand you know the broader lay of the land, uh, and then see how some of those play out so that we can you know see where gaps or overlays kind of exist, uh, and then information sharing is something that we. Uh, try to pour a lot of attention into, given the world that we live in. Uh, this is of particular importance. We want to be the competent authority, and we want the uh, public to kind of listen to uh, those that are in authority. Uh, and if there's some gap there, uh, somebody will fill that. And uh, so there's a large need to sort of be heavily leaning on getting information out, being transparent uh, with the, the public and the media and all stakeholders. Um, and one thing I failed to mention is uh, when we're talking about coordination, we're not just talking about maybe some of the principles that I've already talked about, but the private sector, anybody that would have a hand in uh, helping us recover from an event like this is those that we want to sort of encourage to play along so that we'll understand how our, uh, where they fit within the bigger puzzle. Next slide. So here's a, a sort of a graphical representation of the uh, typical exercise that helps to guide our program and evolve our program. And it's somewhat limited uh, and it, it's, it's good in, in a lot of respects and it's designed more for, from an inspection standpoint. Uh, but some of the complications is the limited sort of, the limited time scale that it operates and the time compression uh, so you go from normal operation uh, all the way through a GE in about a, a five-hour time period, uh, sometimes less. Uh, so there's a lot packed into that sort of uh, compressed time frame, and you're trying to exercise, you know, objectives and meet all of the criteria and design all the documents that help to uh, get your leadership prepared to sort of move information outside of your borders. Uh, and that can become very problematic and difficult. Um, so. In comparison to you know an exercise like this, where it will play out on on a more realistic time frame, 
is it'll and it allows us to practice things beyond uh, the the plume phase and into post plume. Uh, I think are the real advantages so we can get to see uh, how our organization will interact with a lot of those nets components that Wendy talked about. You know, those are things that normally don't play out during our exercises, so we don't have an opportunity to see what that might look like and how that might impact, you know, our center, uh, as well as the leadership component, being able to understand, you know, what all these other pieces are that, that are happening, you know, outside of the NRC borders. Next slide. Uh, so I talked a little bit about the compressed time frame in which the normal exercises operate and the benefit of operating on a larger time frame where you have, you go into the immediate actions uh, and then you cascade into more plume, post plume activities and then you get to play those pieces out which is something we don't ever really traffic in during our normal exercises. Wendy alluded to uh, uh, SE 15 or Southern Exposure 15. Uh, back in 2015 where we played in that large scale exercise in South Carolina. That was very beneficial and we got a lot of great lessons learned. I think that allowed us to sort of move that needle in terms of how we prepare. Uh, but then you skip 10 years later and we have another one. I think the, the, what we would like to promote is maybe we shouldn't wait quite as long to, to start exercising uh, a little bit differently. And, and that's what I find so valuable about this particular opportunity. Uh, the scope of the exercise and the, the, the sweeping scenario will allow us, you know, the advantage of uh, being able to uh, look at our cooperative uh, agreements across the board, both uh, internal to the, you know, domestic, uh, federal community, state, local, all the things that we would uh, normally rely on, but both internationally and what what that international community might look like in terms of uh, their need for information. Uh, and then in the planning is one of the most important pieces and uh, I'd like to amplify this as much as I can is we are learning a great deal about how it is that we would expect all of these pieces to kind of fit together and where lanes exist uh, in the lead up to the exercise and we are also using that sort of time frame to be able to develop training and be able to train our leadership and the players so that they'll understand how this thing plays out beyond the, the normal uh, that we uh, typically train and exercise them on. Next slide. So these are some of the, the sort of key partners uh, that we are principally um, excited to play with uh, and exercise bilateral agreements with both IEEA Canada and possibly, you know, others, uh, but just all of the assets and the entire community kind of coming together to truly understand uh, how this thing will be managed uh, as a collective whole. Next slide. So specific to the NRC, one of the key objectives that we want to learn is when we do have an event of this magnitude, what will the leadership component look like? not just the leadership that uh, sits within our centers that is operationally controlling you know, our missions, but the more holistic one, the lead federal agency and the unified coordination group and how will it be manned and what uh, authorities will these people have and how will that work and uh, the training that they're gonna have to have. These are some of the things that we're looking to sort of iron out in the lead up to this so that when we can prepare our leadership to fill those roles uh, and then truly see how this is gonna uh, play out, uh, and then we can do some course correction uh, beyond that. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> Wendy alluded to you know some of the recovery components that might play out, uh, but even in the lead up in that longer sort of stretch of time uh, post plume, we will be leading into recovery and some of the recovery activities that would normally we'd need to be prepared for, uh, much of which is you know, the, the source of funding that might come to uh, bear, uh, the, the NRC's responsibilities under the Price-Anderson Act and how that uh, financial uh, insurance will kind of be brought to bear to those that are uh, being affected by this <clears throat> downstream, how that uh, uh, liability and our action or our responsibilities under that act will play out in the court systems uh, when we uh, develop a um, 
a plan for distribution along with you know in insights from uh, others uh, how uh, this uh, insurance allotment will be sort of um, provided to the the court system for them to understand you know how uh, the finances will fl flow in terms of those that were directly affected by this but it also uh, brings into question, you know, Price Anderson isn't going to cover the expense of it all. And what are those other uh, funding mechanisms, whether it be the Stafford Act or its other appropriations? Uh, and this will allow us to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper and understand, you know, how all these things will sort of mechanically work um, and then how that will sort of work internally for us. Uh, and then there are other things. Uh, packed into recovery. Uh, things like, you know, recovering the material that was sort of uh, spread out uh, based on any uh, plume or uh, release of radioactive material, the storage and cleanup of that, you know, how that will be managed. Uh, recovery of the site, so inside the fence, and what what is that going to look like in terms of the NRC's oversight of, you know, those activities and any post-inspection activities as well. Next slide. Will also allow us to do a sort of a deeper dive in some of the other uh, parts of our response organization, I, primarily some of the ones that I've already mentioned, uh, more plume, post-plume, and what those activities might look like and how those um, might impact us and how we might be able to staff that along the way, uh, what kind of training might they need. Uh, examining our procedures and ensuring that, that the full federal piece and the framework is sort of embedded in there and un well understood. Uh, making sure we have a robust ability to evaluate uh, the, the exercise itself as well as all the lead up and training and being able to take those lessons and sort of embed those um, into our program. And then offer, you know, advanced training opportunities. Uh, so one of the things that's been talked about in the planning is, you know, availing ourselves or the, the whole community of, uh, of training that might be available out there. So those are some of the benefits in the lead up to this that we're going to be looking to take advantage of. Next slide. And in conclusion, so I think I've talked about all these components sort of individually, uh, but as we take you know, each of these, the integrated stakeholder engagement, uh, as well as the, you know, the timeline realism, uh, being able to uh, learn from this in the lead up to and then post event, uh, as well as, you know, trying to eke out of this as much as we can from a recovery standpoint uh, and better understand, you know, what recovery might look like or the intermediate phase of the event. Uh, is going to be extremely valuable to to see you know how that's going to impact our mission, how we can better prepare ourselves uh, and make adjustments. Next slide. And there's my contact information. I encourage you if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. All right, great, Jeff. Thanks for that overview for NRC. Uh, next, we'll hear the EPA's perspective. I'd like to introduce um, Wagner Prelo from EPA. He is Associate Director for the Center for Radiological Emergency Management in the Office of Air and Radiation. He has 38 years of federal experience as a health physicist with the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, Naval Sea Systems Command, and the U.S. EPA. His current activities include coordination and participation in several programs. I'm not going to list all of them, but some of them include FERMAC Consequence Management, um, FEMA Federal Radiological Preparedness and Coordination Co Committee, the EP Removal Managers and Special Teams, MARSIM Course Training, and EPA Radiological Emergency Response Team. Um, welcome, Magnus. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to share EPA's uh, re uh, recovery experience uh, plans for CM25. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by just uh, low housekeeping with the basic EPA uh, mission statements and basically to protect human health in the environment and more specifically my office, Office of Radiation and Indoor Air, uh, where my office is, my center is focused on, 
uh, obviously the radiation protection of the uh, um, environment and public health. Next slide, please. And to execute the EPA's overall mission of protecting human health in the environment, we have uh, 10 regions throughout the United States to carry out this particular our mission. And uh, that link, as you see there, we have radiation advisors specifically in those regions that can answer uh, and support state and local tribal and, and territorial governments uh, to address any radiological specific information or concerns in their regions. So uh, that's available to you. Next slide, please. The overall authority of EPA under the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, uh, that's a broad uh, response authority that EPA has to address uh, hazardous, con hazardous constituents in the environment particularly be it um, chemical or radiological. And the type of response falls into two basic categories, uh, short-term or removal actions and more long-term uh, cleanup that would may involve several years of uh, effort. Uh, for an exercise like a, like a wide area type uh, contamination event similar to what may occur from a nuclear power plant event. Uh, the different types of EPA response may fall into either one of those categories, obviously initially for resolving any immediate uh, environmental uh, or human hazards from radio radioactivity, it would be a short-term removal associated with um, uh, our relocation PAGs or protective actions. So uh, we will have uh, a on-scene coordinator that would be leading that effort for EPA to address those immediate hazards uh, in, in the phase of the response. And for a longer term uh, cleanup, uh, we would have a, a radio remedial managers there for addressing and remediating uh, sites that has uh, long-term consequences for human health. So for uh, exercise like this, we can expect kind of uh, two of those, uh, both of those aspects to be involved at some point in time. Uh, next slide, please. We spoke of uh, Stafford Act response. Of course, uh, when the uh, governor of a state request uh, assistance and the presidential uh, declaration is given, a Stafford Act uh, will, will be issued and EPA will provide its um, response or radiological response through uh, ESF 10, the emergency support function 10. And of course you see here under this structure we would have the support of many other agencies, particularly DOE. Um, uh, Homeland Security, as you can see, it's a long laundry list of them that also have, you know, response uh, capabilities and that would be able to support EPA in its mission to um, provide the remedial support to address radiological contamination in the environment. Next slide, please. As far as the EPA ra radiological assets, so we have regional assets, as, as I mentioned, throughout the United States, we have the 10 regions, and all these regions have their own assets to responding to uh, emergencies, rheological emergencies, led by a on-scene coordinator. And the on-scene coordinator will have its own uh, contract support that would be readily available to support any radiological uh, needs uh, during a response. And of course, uh, the coordination and, and support from headquarters and uh, headquarters assets as well. Next slide, please. Just to highlight some of the, the headquarters uh, assets that are uh, coordinated through the headquarters effort, um, we have the uh, radiological response, emergency response teams that will consist of 
uh, field teams, uh, laboratory support, um, also consequence management uh, uh, that's available from the headquarters uh, resource level. And we also partner within EPA, our primary partner is the Emer um, Office of Emergency Management that also have uh, consequence management responsibilities and they also uh, manage the, the aerial um, asset, the aspect, which this aircraft has um, chemical and radiological detection capabilities similar to DOE's uh, um, aircraft uh, uh, assets. So along with our field teams, we have a command uh, also a command post, a mobile command post that we can deploy. And not to mention the EPA has fixed radi radiological ear monitors that also has uh, exposure, uh, exposure rate monitoring as well affixed to those monitors. Throughout the United States, we have 140 of, of those monitors, fixed monitors, that operates 24-7. So that would be a, a, a great indicator of any early type of uh, release that would be you know, experienced throughout the United States. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, Wendy already mentioned, gave uh, the overview of the CM25 uh, co cobalt magnet exercise five days full scale and uh, where it's going to be in Michigan there nuclear power plant release. And also to complement that, a month later, uh, EPA would lead a recovery, tabletop recovery exercise that would uh, go sp speak more specifically to the recovery aspects uh, from an event like this. And previous exercises, particularly I can recall uh, Northern, Northern Lights uh, back in 2017 where we actually uh, went through the motion of trans making that EPA, DOE to EPA transfer of responsibility uh, for the recovery aspect of it. But again, it was more of a, you know, a, a, a tabletop discussion about what criteria would be necessary that would enable uh, a, a smooth transfer of from the DOE, uh, uh, the Firm Act to an EPA, which uh, that's one of the things that we are really focused on in this particular exercise, that um, we can spend more time actually looking at the aspects of, okay, once also focusing on the attributes of that transfer plan, we can actually sit down and talk through the actual plan of recovery plan with state and local governments and, and, and understand better what that, uh, the, the uh, funding issues would be involved in that and carrying out that particular type of plan. And, and, and really just would allow us to really explore um, what the recovery would looks like would look like and test our procedures in that particular area, which we have not had the opportunity to do before. So we're really excited to really spend the time talking through uh, and working with our federal partners, state, local, and tribal and territorial partners to, to carry out that plan, as well as our Canadian partners as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I think Wendy already covered the overarching objectives uh, for the uh, exercise, and obviously we want to integrate uh, with our federal partners in the response and recovery of a major radiological incident there. And of course, using our normal framework to do that, the National um, Incident Response and the National Radiological, uh, the National Response Framework, which will allow us to provide that integrated response. And of course, public messaging and sharing of information are key. Next slide, please. These are EPA-specific objectives associated with the five-day uh, full-scale exercise. And it's pretty much the normal things that you would expect 
uh, for an exercise integration, working with uh, DOE's uh, firm MAC, consequence management, um, coordinating with the, sign, the, the, the different field teams, public affairs uh, individuals, technical individuals, um, utilizing the new uh, CBRN uh, responder database to collect that, all of the data coming in for um, supporting decision making. Also, um, the National Response Coordination Center at FEMA headquarters, the radiological, uh, nuclear radiological incident task force is another a relatively new group that we're, um, that uh, FEMA is standing up to support FEMA headquarters and, and EPA's role and uh, serving on that particular uh, task force as well. So again, I'm not going to read all of them there, but those are the key uh, as far as the overall exercise, uh, field support exercise uh, objectives. Next slide, please. Now for the five-day tabletop recovery part of it, again, just uh, some key exercise objectives here and again developing that plan for transfer from EPA from DOE to uh, EPA for recoveries which will involve headquarters regional so it's going to be a big effort there and um, demonstrate that mobilization on okay uh, the uh, firm act and all of its resources and how that would transition under a EPA um, led uh, recovery phase. And again, that the data part of it is going to be crucial. All of the data that was collected during the, re the response aspect of it to address the, um, uh, the early phases of the exercise would be very useful and uh, would need to be coordinated properly and transitioned uh, uh, to EPA with uh, a high level of confidence uh, in the data that it can support, uh, further support recovery with additional information uh, data that would be necessary there in that area. Okay, next slide. We um, have the benefit of participating and coordinating um, with the uh, Nuclear Energy Agency, a national organ international organization that is spearheading the um, International Nuclear Exercise 6, uh, tabletop exercise. And um, this is an exercise series that is offered to all uh, participating uh, uh, member nations under the um, N NEA. And they put together these uh, exercise materials for us for different countries that can carry out and actually perform the exercise themselves. And the key thing here is for us is this focusing on the long-term recovery, which is exactly what we're trying to prepare for for CM25. And the scenario here is that one year after the incident is where we will focus uh, the particular discussions broken down into four modules. And the modules will involve health impacts, food safety, remediation and decontamination, and waste management. So EPA is actually uh, hosting its INEX 6 exercise next week. Uh, so we will have those four modules uh, uh, tabletopped next week. And we had the benefit of sitting in on some of the Canadian uh, tabletop exercise for their modules, and it was very, very uh, useful for us in preparation for our exercise and of course our UK partners as well. So we're looking forward to that next week uh, to carry out those exercises and learn from one another on an international uh, uh, level. So um, next slide. That should pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, I think that would be it. So pending any questions we'll have at the end, uh, that will be in for me. Thank you. Thank you, Wingus. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, 
Representative from Michigan, Scott Marksky. Scott is a radiological emergency preparedness analyst with the Michigan State Police Emergency Management Homeland Security Division. Scott began his career in public safety in 1984 as a firefighter, emergency medical technician with the Grand Ledge Fire Department in Michigan, and then as a 911 operator with Eaton County Central Dispatch in Charlotte, Michigan. Scott accepted the position of state emergency manager from the Michigan Army National Guard in 2014. He was responsible for all hazards planning and anti-terrorism duties at over 50 National Guard locations statewide. Scott accepted his current position with Michigan State Police last year. Um, welcome, Scott. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, this presentation is going to lead in with a video, and I would like to give you a little backstory on that. Um, it's not a radiological exercise at the time I was with the National Guard, so it's an uh, all-hazards evacuation exercise. However, there's many, many lessons learned that could be applied to any exercises. Um, some of the bullet points, it took eight years of planning to make that exercise come to fruition. Uh, there were two planning members, unlike Cobalt Magnet, myself and uh, Mike Casper from Mackinac County, who you will see in the video. Um, uniquely, there was no budget for this exercise. All funding came organically through participants and organizations and communities. Um, it was basically built on volunteers, relationships, a common belief of shared success and community safety. Um, all of the military equipment, believe it or not, is organic to Michigan. The Waterside Operations, the 1437th Multi-Role Bridging Company is located in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, one of 12 units throughout the country. And the Chinook helicopters involved are part of the third of the 238th out of Selfridge Air Base, close to where the exercise for Cobalt Magnet is going to take place. So with that, if you would please cue the video. This exercise has been developed uh, eight years into planning. There's so many, so many agencies involved. Uh, we had 18 listed in the incident action plan, as well as also with our exercise plan. So looking at an all hazards approach, we knew that we had to develop a way to get people off the island. And on any good given weekend, we could have 25 to, to 50,000 people on the island can't fly them off because the airport won't support that, so we have to take them off by boat. If we lost the port, we have to make our own. So that's what this exercise was, was demonstrating that we could create a portable port we could put anywhere on the island and move people from the island onto the ferry boats and back to where they came from. What it encompassed was moving the bridging bays by using the Chinook helicopters behind me to move them over to a specific place over by Mac Island. They were dropped in the water, and then they had boats over there to assemble them into the dock, shove them to shore, so that my walkers could walk onto the dock and then onto the ferry boats, the passenger ferry boats, and then the passenger ferry boats took them back downtown to the island. Building relationships on a blue sky day is so vital. This is a prime example to see how you can have 18 agencies from the local, state, and federal counterparts coming together to focus on practicing a plan in the event that they had an incident uh, on an island or anywhere else in this area. So when we look at the importance of it, it's training, it's coming together, focusing on what they would do in the Emergency Operations Center, how they would function between the Emergency Operations Center and the Incident Command Post, and how they would all come together to make sure that they were collaborating and coordinating and communicating appropriately. I would really like to thank all the partners that came in and the general public that made it a big success for the exercise. So a special thanks to Tom Sivak and his uh, team for that video. We didn't know that was an unexpected um, add-on, but a great way to explain it. Um, basically, everyone at all levels supports an exercise. So even if you don't believe this is in your wheelhouse per se, everything that was executed on the ground comes from somewhere within organizations. And so the content processes, the systems, relationships that you saw in that actually touched federal, state, local, and uh, tribal Partners, what's interesting, there was no lessons to be learned because we don't believe this had ever been done in the United States before. So if you've never been to Michigan, um, why this is unique, Mackinac Island, eight mile perimeter, and as Mike said, sometimes up to 50,000 people in a single day. 
Um, there's, um, these are day trippers, day tourists that come on with no toothbrush, supplies, medications, anything to that point. They expect to come on, shop, and leave. Uh, next slide, please. Unique is there's no vehicles on the island other than public services and emergency. Everything is horse drawn and carriage. So that made it really unique. And in the upper right corner, you'll see the port, which led into the, the following slide on how the exercise was, was played out. Um, these ferry boats traverse between lower and upper peninsula in a major shipping lane, which last year alone had about 110 cruise ships, which anchored in that area and transported uh, passengers onto the island. Uh, next slide, please. So the scenario was built on one of those Great Lakes freighters actually crashing into the break wall, dumping the fuel, and closing the island essentially for a week to 10 days. So as with a radiological emergency, you think about that population and how do you care for 30 to 50,000 people until you can move them to some place safer where you can support their, their basic fundamental and, and health needs. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I threw in this timeline. This is only about 30% of the eight year timeline and the military is very diligent in using these and I didn't take long to be sold on how important they are. Um, personally, in my nine year career, I went through six different supervisors. So trying to keep this exercise engaged and on track um, was difficult. So it helps minimize resistance. It definitely generates buy-in. People can see what you've done, that you didn't create this overnight. It definitely shows that you are determined to get to the end. Um, it can help with employee turnover, which we see. It's a common operating picture. Um, it, it often will answer the questions before being asked. Had you done this? Had you done that? Um, the historical record piece is great, and the five stars on there were five major drills where we tested pieces of this to basically sell that commitment that we can do this, um, we just need your support. Next slide, please. So when you build an exercise, um, creativity is everything, and I would encourage anyone who's part of this at any level, don't think too big or too small. Again, this had never been done. This was two guys standing on a shoreline watching a spill response who dreamed this up. Um, create realistic challenges, smart objectives. Every um, objective here was achievable. Um, the bridging components that you saw are not meant for open water. They're meant to bridge rivers. So this is the first time those boats had just been delivered in April, so they even didn't even have a chance to test these in open water until this. Build your network early and never stop networking. Um, don't fear something new. Um, I have a, a signature, um, my email signature is train for failure. Um, not everything is perfect, we can't get better unless we quote unquote break things from time to time. And break the status quo and have fun. Um, watching these soldiers, we had about 300 soldiers, roughly $100 million in equipment. Uh, no injuries, no hospitalizations, and we believe only about $200 in damage over three days in one of Michigan's Great Lakes. Um, recognition is huge. Um, a new perspective drone services donated all of their time and video. We had about 81 gigabytes of video. Um, those were added onto flash drives. We had coins, went around and delivered to key agencies and key partners. Um, those tokens of appreciation, those videos are fantastic. They can show their families what they got to participate in, probably a first of its kind nationally, and also for training. They can go back in, in bad weather days and look at how their, how their operations um, commenced. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this began with about 18 agencies. It grew to 39 total participating agencies and organizations. The rest of those came unsolicited when word got out that the exercise was happening. Um, people were knocking on our doors. And we did a lot of advertising to let people know that this was going to be a big footprint. We didn't want to think that it was going to be an invasion. The community received this um, with open arms. It was amazing, even to this day, going up there. Um, it's still the talk of the area. Canada was supposed to play with their engineers, they just couldn't get approval. Um, so we did have international interests as well. Next slide, please. 
So finally, for this segment, um, have patience when you build an exercise. That's critical. You have to be adaptable and anticipate what might be coming. As I mentioned, this exercise had no budget. Um, we had to dial into existing training and existing expenses that were already going to be executed. And, and the calendar sync was unlike anything we've ever done before. Um, understanding the costs and personnel staffing, this is a very rural area of Michigan, as is with Cobalt Magnet, that corner, although it's southeast Michigan, where this sits relies on those local agencies. And uh, understanding those constraints and, and how you can better support them. So the next couple of slides I'm just going to highlight on Cobalt Magnet is, again, I don't have a lot of um, knowledge on this as I came into this position just in December. Um, this is from our planning team. Uh, Michigan is focusing heavily on before getting these agencies to understand how great the exercise could grow to pre-positioning, pre-planning, pre-staffing positions and, and understanding what might be coming their way. As we mentioned, it's going to involve all partners at all levels. Uh, next slide, please. They're building a timeline. Timelines are different. You'll see them in all different forms or fashion. I personally grow to the, I've grown fond of the ones that actually show those milestones that you can sell, especially with an exercise that takes multi, uh, many years to plan. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the objectives, they're going to try to make this as real as possible using that technical and scientific data sampling analysis so that the players can actually action on the most real-time, realistic data that's being provided to them. Um, coordination is going to be heavy across all spectrums. The last bullet, I think, is always going to be a stumbling point in any exercise in any event is public messaging. Many, many platforms We've grown to rely on the internet. We've grown to rely on data. What happens if that's not there? Copper lines aren't running to homes anymore. How do you talk to people? How do you let them know? So that community outreach is, is paramount. Uh, next slide. Uh, the assumptions, they're anticipating over 1,000 measles injects. So if you imagine this over a seven-day period, this is going to be moving and shifting a lot of real-time, just-in-time decision-making. Uh, because there's no 24-hour operations, that thousand, um, those 1,000 injects get compressed into 12 hours a day. Um, 100 planning team members, just a shout out to my team, look what you can do with two. And uh, they're expecting hundreds of participants and agencies. So that should be the final slide. Uh, pending any questions at the end, I appreciate the chance to present today. Oh, thank you, Scott. We have our final um, speaker, our international partner. Um, we'll introduce Rowan Morris. He is a provincial lead designer controller for Cobalt Magnet 25, representing Emergency Management Ontario. Rowan is a specialist in the field of off-site nuclear emergency response. He was a team leader for the Royal Canadian Navy's East um, Coast Nuclear Emergency Response Team for eight years and has continued to offer expertise in emergency management and response since his retirement from the Navy in, 20, in 2000, 2006. He's an expert exercise designer and has developed and led some of the largest field exercises in Canadian history, including field exercises delivered in preparation for the Vancouver 2010 Olympics and international exercises involving as many as 14 countries. Welcome, Rowan. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of background on uh, the province of Ontario and how we got involved with uh, Cobalt Magnet 2025. Um, so from a perspective standpoint, Ontario has got one of the largest nuclear footprints uh, per capita in the world with uh, 18 reactors at uh, three nuclear power stations uh, within the province itself. A uh, portion of Ontario also lies within the detailed planning zone of the 10-mile zone of Fermi 2, and the uh, IPZ or IPZ for several other U.S. Uh, reactors, uh, which extends into Ontario. Uh, the nuclear industry in Ontario is growing as a whole. There is a lot of uh, SMR and micro uh, modular reactor interest in Canada. Uh, including provinces in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Ontario. 
and there are active projects underway to develop SMR technology and uh, uh, their applications for licenses uh, are ongoing. So Ontario has got a very large nuclear footprint and uh, in Canada the provinces, uh, the provincial governments are responsible for off-site response uh, to any accident at a nuclear uh, generating station. So within Ontario, uh, that responsibility is charged to a group uh, called Emergency Management Ontario that is uh, part of the Treasury Board Secretariat for the province. Um, and when the uh, Deputy Minister and Commissioner of Emergency Management uh, for the Treasury Board heard about Cobalt Magnet, uh, he directed that we were going to play in full. Uh, following that, we had some discussions with our municipalities, um, equivalent to your counties and uh, our federal counterparts and now all levels of government uh, to very senior levels are going to be playing in CM25 and I think that is mirrored on the U.S. side as well. So we're going to have full government play on both sides of the border for CM25. Uh, Emergency Management Ontario administers the Provincial Nuclear Emergency Management Program which assigns provincial responsibilities within the nuclear emergency management spectrum. Uh, that includes municipal and provincial ministerial level uh, participation and assigns responsibilities uh, by legislation and orders in council. Uh, for a beyond design basis accident or severe accident, uh, the federal government is uh, postured to assist in the response to the province in the event that the province requests it. Next slide, please. So from a Canadian perspective, we, we had a look at CM25 and what the opportunities were. And uh, one of the, the big things that we wanted to look at was uh, the interoperability uh, between federal, provincial, municipal, and international uh, streams. Uh, within Canada, uh, the uh, operators are legislated, basically they're regulated to hold a full-scale exercise every three years that focuses on interoperability. So we do this quite often in the province of Ontario. You can imagine if we've got three stations and they all have to do an exercise every three years, a full-scale, uh, that our exercise dance card is fairly full. Um, however, um, not very often do we get the opportunity to uh, participate in a cross-border event. So we really want to look at the interoperability piece, uh, not only within our own house, but across the border. We also want to look at the integration of the federal, provincial, municipal governments uh, into the command and control and how that is mirrored on the American side of the border. Um, there's going to be some very interesting discussions in terms of command and control and who talks to who during the exercise and a lot of the bilateral agreements that have been put in place and some of the uh, even lower level documentation um, will be exercised uh, really for the first time, uh, we believe. Um, so that speaks to the uh, Canadian American Joint Operational Response. I'll speak to that a little bit more. Um, we talked about uh, data sharing earlier, um, you know, pre and post release. Uh, there was some mention earlier about uh, CBRN responder. And Ontario is uh, attempting to be the first non-U.S. entity uh, to actually uh, be able to utilize RAD Responder, a component of that um, program, um, so that we can do that joint information sharing uh, across the border in both directions. Obviously, uh, an understanding of what the you know gamma dose rate mapping looks like and the ground deposition um, and the sampling results look like is really important in terms of a cross-border response and also important in terms of being able to uh, properly express to the public on both sides of the border a common understanding of what is happening. Um, so we're also interested in examining and implementing the aligned early phase and intermediate phase protective actions. So this is a little different. Um, the can-do reactors that we have in Canada have a different emergency planning zone footprint uh, than the reactors in the U.S. Um, 
So what we uh, do from a Canadian perspective is we will mirror what the U.S. is doing in terms of protective actions. Uh, so this will be the first time that we're actually going to uh, execute that plan. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how that falls out from a command perspective. Um, we'll be testing our public alerting system uh, for an international event and the alignment of cross-border media messaging. I think this one is of particular importance and uh, we stand to gain some very valuable lessons um, as we proceed towards the development, or as we develop the exercise and, and execute in terms of how we get a common picture to the public uh, that is saying the same thing uh, and is realistic and honest and getting in front of that curve or that alternate reality that somebody will put out there uh, and making sure that uh, we're in lockstep in terms of public messaging. So that's, that's a uh, very interesting point for us, not only cross border, but internally, because we're gonna have municipal, provincial and federal uh, communications um, discussing this event, obviously, because it is an international event. So even internally within Canada, we have to make sure that we have common messaging. And then we're going to look at identifying the arrangements needed for recovery in the international incident spectrum. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> enhancing current response plans, I think uh, the ask was to identify gaps um, that we're hoping to uh, identify. Um, so right now, the province of Ontario is engaged in a three-year project um, that is targeted at enhancing the Nuclear Emergency Management Program. Uh, the project is actually scheduled for completion uh, December 2025, and this is looking at all functional aspects of nuclear emergency response within the province. And as such, it's, the implementation is not going to be fully complete for uh, CM25 conduct. Uh, things like um, addition, uh, additional equipment or replacement of current equipment, um, establishment of fixed array systems, deployable capabilities, vehicle-borne surveys, all of that is currently being um, put together. Uh, so there will be some requirement for simulation uh, for CM25. However, it's currently planned that we will deploy our federal assets. Uh, in terms of... Uh, Recovery planning, uh, January 31st of this year was a kickoff meeting to uh, develop an entirely new nuclear emergency recovery pro program for the province of Ontario. So uh, we look towards the, the opportunity being presented by the EPA as a learning point uh, during this um, plan's development as well. Of course, resource constraints uh, are always an obstacle to extended response operations, especially so when we're dealing with something as complex as a nuclear uh, emergency. Uh, so uh, we've commissioned a human factors, a group of human factors experts to uh, conduct a mission function task analysis, uh, which basically looks at a, a top-down approach in terms of what is required, um, what are the critical functional areas within response that need to be maintained for extended periods of time so that we can look at rectifying any issues you've got with respect to resources. Next slide, please. So some of the uh, unique opportunities um, for Cobalt Magnet, we've, uh, we'll be working across all levels of government, as I mentioned, and non-government offices. Um, partners such as the uh, Canadian Red Cross uh, will be engaged in this and uh, you know, that, that domestic and international uh, exercise planning is a huge opportunity. And I always say that uh, the, oftentimes the most um, lessons learned during an exercise or during the development process, because uh, we drill down deep into the plans and we always ask the question, okay, what do we expect people to do? Um, because we need to have an understanding of what the response is gonna look like. And often we identify gaps during the planning process uh, that we can rectify and then verify during actual execution. So uh, that is a, a big opportunity uh, in Ontario's eyes. Um, I mentioned the enhancement of the Nuclear Emergency Management Program within the province of Ontario. 
and actually the development of this exercise has already identified a few areas within that program development um, that need additional bolstering. So uh, we're using the opportunity in a live sense, if you will, in order to uh, help with that program development. Um, we don't very often get an opportunity to uh, play, especially in a radiological situation across the border. I think the last time, uh, to my knowledge anyway, was uh, prior to the Olympics when we had a radiological um, scenario, uh, counterterrorism scenario uh, that was put together and that included uh, cross-border support uh, from the U.S. And of course, building relationships and participating organizations is a, uh, a keystone of any exercise development. Um, you know, being able to shake hands with people that you rarely talk to on a day-to-day -day basis and get to know them and uh, be able to pick up the phone in the event of something real happening and saying, hey, Scott, it's Rowan. Um, you know, we've got a problem and we know each other and we know what we need to do. So that is a, a huge benefit of Cobalt Magnet. Next slide, please. So I I've, I've, think I've talked through uh, most of these. Um, I guess one of the big ones here is to uh, kind of exercise that transition to recovery on the, the last couple of days um, during the uh, full-scale exercise and leading into the uh, April tabletop exercise. I think that'll be a very large benefit. That's something that we don't often practice. Um, next slide, please. Super. So, again, thank you for the opportunity to present and uh, turn it back over. Thanks, Ron. Well, we just heard a great spectrum of perspectives from um, just a few participants in Cobalt Magnet 25, and we have just under 20 minutes. Um, good news is we have a significant number of questions. Bad news is we can't get through all of them. Um, some are very broad and some are very technical specific. I will try to go through as many as we can and start with some of the broader ones first. Um, offer the first one to Wendy to kind of kick it off, but also offer other panelists to chime in, um, trying to combine a few here together. From the state of New York, um, how are lessons learned and practices from these broader and more involved exercises to be publicized so other states and agencies can learn and benefit as well? This also leads to a few other similar questions. Which organization will formally evaluate the Cobalt Magnet 25, and I think for you and everyone else, will um, DOE and other agencies have their own formal reports that will be published afterwards? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so it's a good question. So what we do from the Department of Energy standpoint is we put together an interagency after action report. Uh, I actually wrote the one for CM22 as well. Uh, so any topic or where there are observations that cross cut more than one agency it will get, if it's significant enough, put into this interagency report. Uh, for Cobalt Magnet, Magnet Series, we also do collaborative exercise evaluation forms, meaning uh, we don't require it, but we highly, highly recommend that everybody participate in putting their observations using its Microsoft of Forms uh, so we all can see all of the observations. So that's the evaluation process. And again, it's not graded, so it's really more to capture those best practices and those areas in which we can improve together and then share those together so everyone can see and we're not just kind of rice bowling are, are things that we don't want to share. Um, and then from there, we also recommend that each individual organization write up their own internal after action report specific to their plans and procedures and the things that maybe don't cross cut agencies, uh, but they wanna work on internally. And we also do that as well. Um, anyone else wanna elaborate on that? If there's anything further? From a Canadian perspective, uh, exercise evaluation is a very important component of exercise uh, design, um, and we are currently developing a evaluation uh, criteria. Um, so at the Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 level, uh, we'll be examining <clears throat> things like interoperability, um, and communications, and that, those types of things, um, and very similar to the U.S. perspective when it comes down to individual organizations. Uh, we would expect them to uh, develop their own evaluation criteria uh, and establish uh, after action reports from that as well. Interestingly enough, within the Nuclear Emergency Management Program in Ontario, there is an audit and evaluation program that's built into that that requires 
um, any lessons learned or any lessons uh, from an after action report to be tracked uh, for execution as well. Thank you. And as I relate uh, the question to uh, the exercise southern exposure that we uh, had in 2015, uh, I think the lessons learned that were uh, co coupled together uh, and shared with the larger community, both the, the industry as well as the state and locals and, and the federal community, uh, were f widely sort of fanned out there so that we could all understand, you know, the outcomes and where we could uh, make adjustments within, you know, our respective plans. So I think that's a good um, example of how we took a large-scale exercise and the collective lessons learned and then uh, made sure that that was available to you know, all that could benefit from it. Okay, a question for um, other stakeholders, a general question to um, what extent have we engaged with tribal nations in the U.S. or in Canada on, on the upcoming exercise and what do you see the role to be um, next year? I guess I'll start, and then I don't know if uh, Scott has anything else on this, but uh, we have just reached through our, our planning team members to find out if there were any tribal areas um, impacted by our scenario or just would want to participate, to my knowledge, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe we've had any engagement to that level still as of this day. I, I don't believe so. I don't believe we have a tribal footprint down there, per se, so that's definitely, we have a person in our office that does tribal outreach, that is one of the ongoing conversations. Make sure we don't miss that if it is there. Okay. Yep. Uh, so this is a little bit more specific question. With the proximity of davis Bessey to CM25 exercise, will they also be involved and how so? Um, and will there be any testing or deployment of the Memphis Safer Center to exercise on flex capabilities? I'm not familiar with either of those, Scott. Um, so from an NRC perspective, I don't believe that there would be any engagement with davis Bessey. Uh, I don't believe that the scenario might would impact them other than they may become aware of it and uh, if it were a real event, uh, they, they could be in close proximity to where there could be some uh, effect on uh, the plant and the the, the alarming equipment, um, but I don't think that there's any engagement with Davis Bessey uh, for them to be a participant in this. Not that we're, if certainly if there's an interest there, uh, we can take that from a planning perspective and see how we can make that happen. Um, in terms of flex equipment, I, I don't believe that there's been any talk of you know flex equipment uh, related um, exercising. Uh, but we're somewhat early in the uh, scenario development, so that might, you know, if we determine that there's some uh, benefit there that we would might want to exercise to some degree, uh, we could take that on as a planning uh, team and, and see if there's something that we can do on that front. Yeah. Okay. Another specific question maybe for um, Scott and Wendy. Um, to what extent will Cobalt Mega 25 exercised the command and control and integration of a medical response to the incident. I guess I can start, or do you want to start, Scott? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I, we, the exercise is spanning all of the command and control uh, nodes from you know state, local, all the way up you know through the federal. So that piece and the the NIMS ICS framework is is very much engaged. Uh, in terms of the medical piece, I know that there's been a lot of resource or outreach lately to the hospitals in Michigan, as well as uh, some of the EMS people uh, have been engaged recently on some of the working group meetings that I have been on over the last uh, month or so. I know that they have been spinning up. Uh, those elements and how that intersect is something that we're still working on and planning as we're just coming up on the mid planning meeting next month. I think that'll be further refined as we go along. And then if any, I've missed anything from my colleagues. No, well, I think um, so Michigan's emergency management regions, they have healthcare coalitions. Those are those points of contact and they are the um, coordinator for all those downtrace local EMS agencies and hospitals. So. 
again, I'm getting spun up, but I believe they are involved in that to try to collaborate who that response would be, and, and especially a huge mutual aid factor that would probably be needed, such as an EMAC. Okay, good. <clears throat> I have a question, a two-part question. Um, how does the federal government coordinate deconflict and concur on radiological plume distribution of models as part of this exercise? And um, part two, will um, Canada mirror U.S. protective actions? Will their decisions be based on independent data that you have or on our, our data that we have here? I guess I'll start with part one. <laughs> uh, so with the with this exercise specifically, so it's Department of Energy led, so we're on the hook within our modeling capability to make the ground truth model. Uh, what we do, and we actually did this uh, about a year ago, is we sit down with all of our partnering organizations and we discuss what each one's objectives are, uh, what they want to do, and then and while ensuring that we're aligning with what we need from our training perspective, we come up with the, the first picture of what that model run should look like that is our ground truth, you know, answer key, if you will. Uh, we then present it to the planning team as it exists at that time in its entirety to get buy-in into that meeting their needs and that there's no objections to it. Uh, if there are, then we go back and we do it again until everyone has agreed that it meets their needs. Uh, so that, that was the process that we did for CM25. Um, that's what we've always done. And then we keep it really close held just amongst the planning team, of course. And I, I guess uh, <clears throat> part two to that question regarding protective actions and uh, the fact that uh, we base our response on mirroring uh, protective actions in the U.S. So it's based on uh, the real-time situation. Um, if automatic actions, such as evacuation of a detailed planning zone, is enacted by the U.S. because uh, we have a small portion of the extreme south uh, part of Ontario that falls within that zone, we would also take that same action. Any additional actions that are taken outside of that are based on initially on gamma dose rate mapping and the implementation of uh, operational intervention levels. So it, the, the answer to the question is we, we do mirror, but we also take into account the operational picture um, and actual uh, reading. So the answer is yes to both. Great. Another question about monitoring, um, I aimed uh, mostly at, I think, Wagnus and Wendy. Um, how much overlap of monitoring activities is there between DOE and EPA? Um, how do you coordinate that and, is, you know, how, how, does that, how does that work together between DOE and EPA on um, monitoring? So the FIRMAC is an interagency organization, meaning it exists with EPA as memberships within that cadre of people in DOE. So when the monitoring instructions and the analysis instructions go out through the whole ICS process and what command and controls priorities are on the technical level, it's an integrated and blended team, not just with EPA and DOE, but also with Michigan partners, uh, as well as CST or any others that are engaged within the response. And then um, I'll let Wagnus take the end of when it shifts over in terms of the leadership piece uh, and how that looks as well. Yeah, so EPA and DOE has been doing a lot of um, groundwork building that transition uh, with, the, with uh, EPA management and uh, DOE management to make that transition. And during the CM22 exercise, we actually try to you know, uh, exercise that with EPA representatives embedded in the uh, firm act and to understand all of the decisions and the planning. And so when that transition time comes, planning has already has started um, and elements developed to, um, to make that trans transition. And we're going even further for CM25 where we want before the, that transfer takes place from DOE to EPA, we want to actually have EPA uh, managers actually run the firm act for some period of time just to ensure a, a smooth transition uh, during that that uh, recovery phase so a lot of work is going into that hey, thanks a question for Rowan is Ontario planning to participate in a review of longer term recovery financial impacts in remediation of ingression pathways 
Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is uh, we are, as I, I mentioned, I believe, <clears throat> um, we are currently uh, developing our uh, recovery operations plan uh, for a uh, post event. Um, and as part of that, compensation is a big piece. Um, I actually just uh, worked uh, an exercise with the Nuclear Insurance Association of Canada uh, that speaks to compensation. Um, and we also have the, uh, within Ontario, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, that plays a role uh, outside of what uh, the Nuclear Insurance Association provides. So. Uh, the compensation piece is being looked at very deeply. Uh, in terms of remediation, that is another piece uh, that is also being looked at. Uh, specific to CM25, an interesting question is if we get contamination, if we get contamination uh, cross-border, um, what systems are in place right now? Um, is it the Price-Anderson? Is it uh, the Nuclear Liability Compensation Act in Canada? What, what mechanisms are in place there in terms of compensation and the remediation piece as well. Okay, great. Uh, another question, quick question for Jeff. Um, does NRC have any role in, um, in playing a radiological response not initiated by the nuclear power plant accident? Uh, repeat that again. Does NRC have any role in radiological responses not initiated by a nuclear power plant accident? Um, so the NRC's response program has the capability to um, respond to a, a wide cadre of events, whether it be an event uh, that materializes here from one of our licensees to a, a range of other events that we uh, could stand up and prepare for if there's an eventual uh, impact to a, a licensee or an operator, uh, so some type of weather event. Uh, or events that might uh, deem, be deemed like it would have a, it, some type of impact, uh, like a cyber event that could take down a part of the grid that we might be able to stand up in anticipation for what impacts that might have. Uh, we also have the capability to um, assist uh, Department of State and others on events that might be happening you know, outside of our borders, we have bilateral agreements. Uh, if something were to happen in Canada, you know, assisting with that as well as informing, you know, um, our government in terms of its impact on uh, the United States. Um, and then certainly from a materials, anything that we might uh, have a statutory authority over, uh, we have the capabilities to be able to respond to you know, like events, either whether it be a transportation uh, or something that happens at a fuel facility, uh, we have equal capabilities and we exercise those uh, areas as well. Okay. All right, one final question. I'll ask the panel white weigh in just quickly. It's a more logistical question. Um, it's a good question. Of a multiple day event from diff with different agencies, organizations, how do you plan, how do you plan to staff it and maintain staffing over a multiple day period with the people you have on call? I'll start, sorry. <laughs> uh, so part of our jobs as a planning team is to identify all the staff positions that are required, um, and then within each organization, create a staffing plan that becomes the entirety of it. So based off of the objectives and the types of response functions that are in play, uh, we have you know everybody come to the table with what they need. Uh, and that's part of the job of preparing for this activity as a whole. And then uh, we have a logistics working group that also coordinates the other details, such as you know where they're going to sleep and things of that nature, as well as um, working with everyone within the organizations. If anybody wants to add it to that. Anyone add to that? Uh, so I would echo a lot of what uh, Wendy had said in terms of um, staffing and uh, how we would roster an event like this and what the watch bill would look like over an extended period of time is always a bit of a challenge. Uh, we don't get an opportunity to exercise that a lot, so that's one of the objectives that we might sort of insert in terms of how our uh, response program would sort of scale itself uh, based on the needs of the event. Uh, we have a depth in the program and we want to get a lot of people uh, interested and included in this exercise, so I'm sure that we will 
through the course of the exercise and, and trying to plan out how we're going to sort of share that benefit, um, you know, we'll have to kind of get a lot of people involved. Um, so I will pause there, see if anybody else has anything. I know we're pinching close on time. Yeah, from the Canadian side of the border, um, this isn't a 24-7 exercise. Uh, I've done those and they are very grueling and uh, really put people through their paces. Um, from an exercise controls perspective, as we plan towards this, we have uh, representatives from every single organization that is participating. And those are the folks that will be controlling and evaluating the exercise. Uh, so we, we have that piece covered. And I would say in terms of response and staffing, I think that's one of those things that we want to see play out during the actual exercise itself. If something else real world comes up and that totally inhibits a capability to provide a response to this exercise scenario, well, that's a, that's a lesson to be taken away and looked at. All right, great point. We'll end on that. Um, <clears throat> thanks again to the panel for the great perspectives. Really demonstrates the um, power collaboration. It'll be a good test. Um, before we wrap up, I want to um, recognize um, not only panel but Jeff for putting together the panel. Um, uh, Bennett, please raise your hand. Um, he helped put this together behind the scenes. He's our up and coming emergency response star. One day he'll be up here speaking. Um, also, I see I think Christian and um, the key out there. I got some bright lights. It's hard to see, but let's give a round of applause to the panel. And thank you, that includes this session, thank you. Well, I think we will. <laughs> I hope so.